evening, folks. Um, thank you all for coming out. My name is Mike Dyer. I'm the Curator of Maritime History here at the New Bedford Whaling Museum, and you have arrived four square at the, uh, at the first Local History Guild of 2023. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, as you know, you know, the Local History Guild is a, is a, is a guild of like-minded people interested in history and local history, and there's a whole lot of us out there, um, and all you got to do to join is, uh, is to show up. So you show up to the Local History Guild Zoom and automatically you are a member. Um, and so, uh, uh, so it's good to, good to have everybody here. Um, the, tonight, this is very interesting. Tonight is a sort of quintessential uh, Local History Guild. Uh, this is the system at work, right? So um, uh, one of our regulars, uh, Bob Demanche, you know, we know Bob, you know, he's an, he's an author, he's, he's written for the History Press on the Schooner Coral, and he, and he and he uh, and he's and he's worked with uh, Spinner Publications, you know, for years, and uh, is currently, you know, working on some some Fairhaven history. Uh, and Bob's been coming to these local history guild, uh, you know, meetings in person and the Zooms for years. And and we, you know, he, he contacted contacted me and, and and told me about a great uh, presentation that Elizabeth York had given. The, Elizabeth York is the uh, executive director of the of the Cape Cod Maritime Museum. And uh, and and Bob said, you know, she did this great thing on um, on on uh, on steamboats, and uh, and I was like, oh, that sounds really cool. We should we should we should have her uh, come under the local history guild, but we should we should uh, really tie that into to the the full full parameters of the story, right? Which include uh, which include New Bedford, of course, um, but it also includes Martha's Vineyard and includes Nantucket. So you know. Uh, one of our uh, one of our at this point regulars on the local history guild, uh, Bo Van Riper from the Martha's Vineyard Museum, uh, agreed. You know, he was he, he said, "Yeah, I'll 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 talk about the Martha's Vineyard end." And then Michael Harrison, Michael, you're the you're the uh, chief curator at Nantucket. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, yeah yep. the chief curator at the Nantucket Historical Association is on board. So, uh, so we have a, a full um, a full roster. Uh, of presenters tonight, uh, Elizabeth is um, is going to be our feature um, our featured speaker. But um, uh, but if if Bob's um, uh, if he can get his PowerPoint working and his screen share going, I'd like to open with Bob. And, and if he can't get it open, we'll we'll uh, we'll continue with the program. And uh, but at any rate, Bob, what um, what what was it? That really sparked your interest in this particular subject. So it, while, while we're waiting for Bob to uh, to come back online, yes, um, uh, yeah, here he is. Uh, I heard Elizabeth's talk, and um, uh, I just found it. You know, I finally started to understand. You know, the whole idea of the steam engine, um, which versus the uh, internal combustion engine. Um, which is, uh, uh, I don't, shouldn't really want to admit that because my father was a, a steam fitter and my brother worked on tugboats and um, uh, other uh, vessels after graduating from Mass Maritime. But the, um, I learned a lot and just uh, putting together the whole business of the, the railroads and the uh, steamboats and who owns who and who controls who and how, um, you know, just getting that put together was um, just really helpful. So now I have an, a sense of where I'm going with this, with this steam, uh, steamship topic. Yeah, we were just chatting about that earlier about, the, you know, that, that's no small subject. The, the, the genealogy of these companies is, uh, is quite complex. Um, and, uh, you know, it ties into the railroads and it ties into, uh, it ties into ferry companies and um, so it, you know, it's it's really a very interesting kind of examination of the way um, the way transportation and business has sort of you know worked in this. Uh, in I think this I. Oh, I've, here we go! Look at that. Yeah. All right, fantastic. Yeah. You're going to walk us through for a couple or a few minutes, Bob. Yeah, sure. Um, okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm uh, um, thankful everybody's here. Um, and let's just move on. First, what I want to do is um, 
uh, just put up a, a um, see how I get this going. Oh, yeah, boy. Okay. Okay. I want to just orient this because I know some people I know a lot from the area. Um, and so when we're talking about today, uh, the, um, you know, the basic cities that were involved in all the different uh, um, versions of the authority or the steamship, we're talking about um, cities such as New Bedford here, and, uh, and also was Hull down in Falmouth, Hyannis uh, as another point of departure. Um, we're talking about Vineyard Haven and Oak Bluffs as uh, departure and um, places, of, uh, you know, boarding and also in Nantucket uh, down here. So that's the general area that we're covering. And if I have a second, I may even talk a, a little bit about the fact that some of the excursions would come out, uh, at least from New Bedford out here to uh, Nunquit and South Dartmouth or onset in Wareham um, and uh, or possibly to uh, Cuddy Hunk. And so uh, I'm going to focus more on the um, New Bedford Harbor aspects. Now this, I'm not going to be talking about uh, the steamships inter-island. There were two steam lines um, that go way back and uh, in New Bedford Harbor itself. And so here's the, uh, an old 50, 1855 map from, we see on the right side, the Fairhaven waterfront, Fairhaven village. On the le le west side of the, uh, the harbor, we have New Bedford uh, and so forth. And then we'll get into this in a second, the Fairhaven Branch Railroad going from Fairhaven over to uh, Wareham at Tremont. And uh, it's, I think it's at the point where they um, hook up to a train going to Boston. So you have, uh, this is about a mile wide, more or less. And you have, uh, exchange, you know, the ferry bringing back uh, passengers and freight. And then there's the rail, the New Bedford and Taunton Railroad uh, in this, uh, I guess it's located up here. So you have, you know, goods can be distributed and received. Uh, and that it becomes a, a multi-modal uh, route for that. Um, and so, um, let's see, I'm gonna even a close up. It's, there were two lines um, early in the thirties, um, there was a, um, the New Bedford and Fairhaven Ferry Company, um, one of, uh, we were just, and, and later on in the, uh, after 1854, when the railroad Fairhaven Branch Railroad was completed and began running. Um, here's the old ferry, the first. I'll talk a little bit about that. And down here is the um, uh, Fairhaven Branch uh, where they had the ferry weaving here. So here up at the, uh, at the bottom of Center Street, um, there was Handy's Wharf in the early 30s. Um, the uh, at first it was just a sailing a sailing vessel, just a sloop going across the harbor, starting in the morning, ending in the evening, going back and forth. Um, and one of the first vessels there, um, I'll uh, show it right now, is uh, the Fairhaven, uh, common or derisively or affectionately known as the Crab, depending upon. How you see it. The interesting thing about this vessel, you can see it on the right side. They're using a tiller for steer, steering um, and uh, the paddle wheel here, uh, uh, the side wheeler. Um, interesting story about that. On the corner of um, Water and Middle Street, there was a well, and this is right adjacent to the Handy's Wharf, and Otis Hitch talks about as a young boy, the, the young boys would get a real thrill because they would go to, um, they would go to where the ferry was leaving um, and they would, you know, they could get, um, I get a message that we don't 
can't see the pointer. Okay, I'll, I'll describe it further. But the point is that, um, uh, you know, the boiler, they provide all the power to pump all the water out of the well to fill the boilers of the, you know, the crab, Fair Haven. And when they had done that, then Captain Montague would give them a, you know, free round trip ride. And they, you know, that was the big thrill for them. And so they did that often. So um, the uh, crab had a, so didn't have as much power and you can see the steering abilities on that. So the wind tide and the uh, other weather and water conditions tended to move it sideways instead of forward at certain times. And that's how it got its name. <laughs> and so that was it from the early thirties. And later on the, uh, uh, a larger steamboat, this is from a stereo uh, photo originally. I just uh, edited it so we can see a larger version of the uh, Fairhaven. We can see a large area for loading. Um, and so um, at, so that went on for a while, 1894, the railroad is now running. And so um, vessels are now, you know, the, uh, the ferries leaving from the ferry landing at the end of what well, it Ferry Street um, now is. And um, the uh, line went until 1929 uh, when a combination of factors um, just that was the end of the uh, uh, going to and for, uh, you know, one side to the river to the other. Um, early on in the 40s, there was, you know, there was a lot of um, small uh, attempts by people uh, to create steamboats um, uh, and actually to tow things. Uh, Benjamin Rodman of the Rodman's Wharf, which is now uh, the Haven Shipyard South, so you're talking uh, the eight, 1840s now? 1854. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, the 1840s for this. He had a little steam side wheeler that he towed his uh, little boat known as the Ohio. And they were a water boat for the um, whaling ships. And his little, his little craft had no name, but most of the people called it the water spout. Um, so, um, as I said, um, one thing I want to bring out, the uh, interaction between, in, in those days, uh, tugboats weren't as powerful. Um, it wasn't really worthwhile at this point to become a tugboat company, steam tugboat, because you, know, you couldn't uh, guarantee that the business would be successful. Um, and then, but um, at, Check my notes here. As time went on in the uh, 1800s, um, it, later in the, in the 90s, especially, there was a lot of consolidation of the different aspects that um, uh, the tugboats. Um, so uh, I'll just uh, uh, I'll go through a couple of the pictures to. Uh, Yeah, he was one of the uh, fallen of companies. It was formed. Um, this ended up, yes, this is by Jesse T. Sherman. Um, and you can see Steamer Nelly, Steamer Signet, and a little bit of a uh, stationery from him. Um, here is the Tug Nelly, famous, very famous tugboat. Yeah, great uh, photo. Uh, this tugboat, the steamboat. Um, this was uh, part of uh, Sherman's company, and the, they would go out to Nonquit as a, an excursion. Huh. Uh, there's the JT Sherman. Let me run through. This is not a tugboat, just in <laughs> case you're wondering. But I put it, that up because I'll go in with one significant incident, which uh, combines a lot of these elements. Um, in uh, July 2nd, 1924, the sanctity, which you see uh, partially sunken, um, and that's the end of Union Wharf. You can see Palmer's Island Lighthouse in the distance. Uh, basically, it caught fire on the new, at the, the New Bedford Wharf, 
it the sanctity drifted over. Um, to make a long story short, it was a long night of the Haven and Bedford firefighters pouring water continuously on both the Morgan and the sanctity. Um, and in the end, this is the next day, the Morgan was simply singed <clears throat> at worst. The JT Sherman who had a pump pumping harbor water continuously onto these vessels all through the night. And as a result, um, or one of the results was that the sinking of the sanctity or the burning uh, helped prompt the um, steamship company to um, build the Nobska. So uh, very soon after that. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody and on with the show. Great, thanks. Yeah, that's good. That's good stuff. So har Harbor mm -hmm. Ferries, Harbor Tugs, uh, functioning, mm -hmm. you know, very, very locally between the, the rail lines in New Bedford and the rail lines in Fairhaven, as well as, and I'm sure we'll hear from Elizabeth in a minute and Michael Harrison, absolutely for sure here by and by, um, also ser serving as towboats uh, out to uh, out to the islands. So um, uh, thanks, Bob, and um, we'll field questions sort of at I guess sort of at the end. Sure. Um, uh, and uh, Elizabeth, um, we'll let get Bob close his screen out. Uh, stop sharing his screen. There we go. And uh, and um, uh, Elizabeth York, executive director of the Cape Cod Maritime Museum. Thanks, Elizabeth. No problem. All right, so let me get going here, sharing my screen. Okay. Do that. All right. Okay. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the early days of the um, steamboats and ferries on uh, Nantucket Sound. Um, and I do apologize, I am going to be saying New Bedford, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket like a hundred times in a row, so uh, just bear with me. We're going to go through a really great um, way for all of us to um, figure out who owns what at what time. So um, as Michael said, I'm the executive director of the Cape Cod Maritime Museum. If you haven't been to see us, we are in the inner harbor of Hyannis, just between the Steamship Authority and the Highline Ferries. So you can probably tell why ferries are really close to my heart. They're not only close to my heart, but they're close to my office. So, <laughs> all right. <clears throat> so it's probably no surprise to everybody here. And I do wanna thank Bob for showing everybody a map. Um, uh, it's probably no surprise to anybody in this area that um, back in ye oldie days, there are only a few options for people who are traveling uh, back and forth to the islands of Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard to the mainland. Um, so the main two options for water travel for passengers and cargo in particularly uh, were um, vessels called packets and coasters. These vessels were usually schooners and sloops. Uh, packets were vessels that were responsible for transporting passengers on a semi-regular schedule. And I say semi-regular um, because their schedule was very weather and tide dependent at that point. They could also carry cargo from port to port as well, but they didn't carry the cargo in bulk. bulk. Uh, coasters were sailing vessels that would carry mostly cargo, um, and they did carry cargo in bulk, but they did not operate on a schedule. These coasters occasionally carried passengers, and again, it wouldn't carry passengers on a schedule. Those were the packets. So uh, for those living in those remote and coastal areas, such as Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, these two types of ships were the main conveyance on and off the islands and the main means of conveyance for goods and supplies, such as food um, and perishables, clothing, et cetera. So unfortunately, this means of travel was still very reliant on the tides and winds at that point. Um, and if the tide wasn't favorable or if the, there was a storm of brewing, uh, this would often cause delays in the departure and arrivals of these vessels. The irregularities of this uh, was actually interestingly as accepted as very typical at that point and very highly tolerated. Frankly, the idea of a regular service to and from the islands on a reliable schedule was something that wasn't even really contemplated at this point. And I'm talking about the 18th century here at this point. 
So the whaling industry on Nantucket, as it was growing, um, however, there did begin uh, there did begin to be a need for a regularly scheduled water transportation to the island and the mainland. So <clears throat> steam power was being used commercially around the world by the mid 18th century. Um, I'm thinking about coal mines pumping out water from coal mines. I'm thinking um, uh, the, the, the Industrial Revolution and mills all across Great Britain, for example. However, steam power had not yet been used to propel a boat on water. So William Henry, who was an American from Pennsylvania, built two steam-powered boats as trials uh, using the Watt steam engine in the late 1780s. The Watt steam engine was a, a basic form of um, piston um, powered by steam and a sort of uh, a beam that would go up and down to power whatever the engine was on the other side. Um, so neither of his trials was very successful, but he did manage to pass his ideas on to a fellow named John Fitch from Connecticut, who was a very ornery guy by all records, um, and another fellow named Robert Fulton, also of Pennsylvania, like um, William Henry. Uh, who, no records of him being ornery, though, so I guess he gets the... Uh, a plus for being friendly. Um, Robert Fulton built the first successful commercial steamer. That's the Claremont pictured here. Um, this traveled in 1807 from New York City to Albany via the Hudson River. Um, interestingly, a round trip on the Claremont from New York City to Albany at this point was four days. So we're talking very rudimentary travel at this point. Very slow, very... Um, modest, I would say, for steam power. Um, she ended up operating for Fulton at a, a middling profit until about 1814. So you notice in this image here that the Claremont is actually still equipped with sails. And this was true for most of the earlier steamboats. Um, most often the sails were arranged in an abbreviated brig rig. Um, and while steamers operating on inland waterways stopped needing these types of sails, uh, by around 1825, many of the ocean-going steamers still had auxiliary sails for another few decades due to the rel relative unreliability of steam engines at this point. So 1807 through the early 1820s were really characterized as the experimental small steamer days, especially along the Hudson River. But as the popularity and safety, which I'll get into in a little bit, as the popularity and safety and reliability of steam travel began to grow, uh, new routes began to be explored in areas like New England, including Nantucket Sound. So while steamboats were now a thing by this point, they were still not very safe, um, nor were they very comfortable. So boiler explosions were still quite frequent at this point. The likelihood, um, if you're a traveler, the likelihood of sparks and soot and smoke getting all over your clothing was still incredibly high. Um, so travel on a steamboat could be quite messy and sometimes even deadly. Um, so I, I'm sure you can probably imagine it wasn't really quite popular yet. So it was around the 1830s that they did begin to be seen as a little bit more reliable by the public. Uh, the public didn't, in order to travel on a steamboat, they didn't need to rely on the wind as much to depart from their destination um, or to depart for their destination. Um, whereas weather delays may have kept sailing vessels like those um, packets and uh, coasters from leaving port for days. Sometimes they couldn't leave for weeks depending on the time of year. And while these steamers um, usually left on time, they usually got to their destination on time. So it was really their reliability that kept them popular and in demand. So now we're gonna talk about some vessels that are specific to Nantucket Sound. In 1818, uh, just 10 years after Fulton's first steamer, the vessel Eagle made a trip between New Bedford and Nantucket on May 5th. And so many of the passengers aboard this vessel were Quakers and they were going um, to the island uh, on their way to a friends meeting. And um, the second trip, the return trip was two weeks later. Each trip took about eight hours, just a little bit over eight hours in total. The Eagle was 92 feet long, about 80 tons, and could carry up to 60 passengers. 
Now, at this point, um, the whaling economy of Nantucket was thriving and the commercial trade in and out of the island was really growing. The whaling economy was booming. There was a great need to move people and produce to and from the island, um, especially, especially on a reliable schedule. Martha's Vineyard also had its own ventures into whaling at this point too, but not on the same scale as Nantucket yet. The Eagle only lasted about three months on this route going between New Bedford and Nantucket, um, as there frankly just was not enough patronage and the boat was expensive to operate. Um, interestingly though, um, the Islanders were still really not convinced that steam power was more reliable than wind. Um, and during this time, um, Several different vessels and companies tried to be commercially successful, but poor ridership um, and, and, and just patronage really led to many of these companies quickly shutting down, sometimes often within weeks of being formed. So from the time the Eagle left Nantucket in September of 1818, no other steam vessel came to the island until 1824. After 1824, a few other boats tried to ply the waters between the mainland and the islands. Many were very, very low power. Some were often too low power and some could only make the journey if the wind and the tides were favorable. But hang on, didn't we just say that steam vessels were popular because they were reliable and they didn't need? Well, yeah, now you can probably see why the islanders weren't too sold on steam vessels yet. So there was one vessel in particular that I like to reference. It was called the Hamilton. Uh, this vessel um, uh, in 1828, it was so underpowered that they were stocked with barrels of tar to throw into the boiler uh, for more power in a critical situation. Uh, and the smoke and the sparks that would often result from this um, got her the name, uh, the dragon. Uh, I'm sure you can probably imagine why. I'm sure it was quite a sight when she came in, um, spilling out, spewing smoke and fire and all that. Um, again, this was yet another instance where the, uh, the, the the islanders are still really not convinced that steam was reliable yet. Um, another factor that added to this is that the islanders' view on reliability was not quite sold yet. They were still operating with the understanding that reliability wasn't always uh, wasn't always possible. Adding to all of this is that many of the boats, many of these steam vessels were only able to operate six to seven months of the year due to the harsh winters at this time. So other vessels that plied the sound in these early days included the Marco Bazaris. Uh, she arrived to Nantucket in the spring of 1829. Um, this is not an actual um, image of the vessel, it's just from a general sort of newspaper ad for it, but um, at that point they were using a lot of these types of um, images for a lot of the steam vessels around the country. Um, so the Bazaris was operating on the route between New Bedford and Nantucket, and very similar to the Eagle, this little steamer was not quite the financial success that her owners believed that she would be. Um, however, her owners really kept at it. And by the second season, uh, the reputation for this steamer and steamers in general kind of began to grow, which was kind of an exciting thing. Now, a majority of her popularity and the majority of this vessel's use, interestingly, though, was from excursions um, and not necessarily the conveyance of passengers or freight between the mainland and the island. A majority of the business was with groups traveling on pleasure trips between Nantucket and New Bedford. Uh, they would often stop at various other points along the coast, including Cuddy Hunk. Um, the, the Marco Bazaris made the first trip ever by steam to Martha's Vineyard. Uh, she brought 210 people to Edgartown from New Bedford, and soon the Bazaris oh. made another similar voyage, um, bringing people between the two islands, between Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, which was undoubtedly the first steam trip between the two islands themselves, which is quite fascinating. When, when was uh, this again, Elizabeth? What? This was uh, 1829, 1830. Wow. She also made excursions between Nantucket and Hyannis, uh, bringing islanders to the mainland of Cape Cod on an excursion. And I'm sure you can imagine for the residents of Hyannis, it was the first time they ever had islanders coming um, in to their to their space. Um, although now, you know, a couple centuries later, it's a little bit different. So it was quite a quite a quite a to do for them at that point. Um, the Bazaar herself was a little bit larger than the Eagle and uh, more powerful. 
She had two copper boilers and she burned wood for fuel. Um, on her trip across Nantucket Sound on the 18th of June, 1831, they actually decided to experiment with using coal for fuel instead of wood. <clears throat> Unfortunately, this experiment didn't work too well as her boilers were designed for wood. Um, and, and so essentially she couldn't generate enough steam with coal. Mm -hmm. However, this did pave the way for further explore, experimentation exploration um, on Nantucket Sound with coal as fuel. Uh, the Bazaars ended her service between New Bedford and Nantucket by 1832. She was sold by her owners in order to form a new company a little bit further south. So <clears throat> I know Michael is going to get into this in a little bit too um, with some other images um, and some artwork, but um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the telegraph that's in the image on the top here. Uh, the telegraph was 120 feet. She made her first trip from Nantucket to New Bedford. Um, sorry to Nantucket from New Bedford in October of 1832. And then a year later, her owners um, in 1833, her owners decided uh, to incorporate the Nantucket Steamboat Company. Her owners were a group of wealthy businessmen from the island of Nantucket. Uh, so they kind of had a lot of skin in the game here. The telegraph was 171 tons, had a 60 horsepower engine and a 17 foot paddle wheel. So the Nantucket Steamboat Company, um, in anticipation and an increase of business, built the Massachusetts. That's pictured here on the bottom image. She was built in 1842 at a cost of $39,000, uh, just over $39,000. She was larger than the Telegraph at about 304 tons, and of course, faster than the Telegraph. And at this point, she was considered the finest steamer on the New England coast. Now remember, this is still the very early days. This is 1842. Uh, by 1834, the Nantucket Steamboat Company put the Massachusetts in use um, going between Hyannis and Nantucket. And this was because the railroad line from Boston had just been extended um, all the way down to Hyannis. And there was a, there was a, a desire for a shorter at sea route to the island of Nantucket. Um, and so the railroad line's extension down to Hyannis provided that option. It was a shorter at sea route um, versus the route that would have gone from New Bedford. So another interesting thing that I like about these two vessels is that while they were not being used for passenger and freight service, they were also used for towing, they were used for salvage, they were used for ice breaking during the winter as well. And salvage especially was a very lucrative trade for the company. Uh, for example, uh, over two days in 1842, the Telegraph and the Massachusetts working together earned a salvage award of $31,000. <laughs> Um, and noting that the Massachusetts herself cost $39,000 to build, it really was not, salvaging was really not a bad gig for the company uh, when these vessels weren't being used for passenger and freight conveyance. Um, in 1848, the rate of passage from Nantucket, uh, from New Bedford to Nantucket was about $2 per trip. Meals were usually an extra 50 cents. So if we're gonna transfer that to today's money, that's usually about $75 per trip with about $18.75 $18 for food. Um, not a bad price for food. Um, $75 for, for a trip could be a little bit expensive, but it's not that far off from the Highline um, um, high-speed ferries, which is a little bit of an equivalent for today's um, conveyance. Um, <clears throat> so you're probably all thinking, Thanks. hold on. You're probably all thinking, what about Martha's Vineyard? You haven't really talked about Martha's Vineyard yet. What, what about, the, was there any early traffic heading there? Because it really seems like everyone was heading to Nantucket. And you're right. Um, but Martha's Vineyard by around the 1845, 1850s era was becoming a more popular place to go. Uh, the steamer Noshon made her first trip to Edgartown in 1846. And she made this trip for the newly formed New Bedford and Martha's Vineyard Steamboat Company. Uh, the Nashon was the first steamer to operate on a schedule to the vineyard, and she was put into service specifically and expressly to serve the vineyard. The Nashon would stop at both Vineyard Haven, which was then called Holmes Hole, and Edgar Town four days a week. Uh, interesting to note, um, from the engineering standpoint, all of the island steamers that I've shown you up to this point have a crosshead engine, um, very different uh, not very different, but ever so slightly different from the walking beam engine. Uh, so these crosshead engines are actually the same type of engine used on Fulton's first uh, steamboat, the Claremont. 
Um, now, walking beam engines were still relatively new at this point. They were used more often on larger vessels that needed a lot more power. Um, at this point, these steamers simply weren't large enough to really warrant the size and the heft that these walking beam engines um, demanded, essentially, from their weight. Um, another thing to note is that by the late 1840s and early 1850s, uh, the Nantucket, um, Nantucket's whaling economy was on an economic decline. Uh, there was a fire that destroyed most of the waterfront in 1846, and then there was a, 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 a relative shift of the whaling business to New Bedford, and this, this really brought hard times to the island, and the citizens of Nantucket soon began to promote the island as a summer resort, and this was in the hopes of bringing the island's economy back up from the loss of the whaling economy. All right, so this slide is intentionally blank, so bear with me for a second. Um, so I had mentioned the move of the Nantucket Steamboat Company's route from New Bedford to Hyannis, um, but what this did is it left open a door for a new company to compete out of New Bedford. So it was fairly soon that the New Bedford Vineyard and Nantucket Steamboat Company was formed. So it's around now that the naming of these companies and the mergers get a little bit confusing and hairy. Um, so I made us all a flow chart to help us out. So in 1855, the Nantucket Steamboat Company reincorporated as the Nantucket and Cape Cod Steamboat Company. And just over 30 years later in 1886, the New Bedford Vineyard and Nantucket Steamboat Company consolidated with the Nantucket and Cape Cod Steamboat Company to become the New Bedford Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket Steamboat Company. There we are. We have arrived at the final name. They're the, the largest shareholder of this company was the Old Colony Railroad, which uh, was sort of the precursor to uh, the New Haven Railroad. Um, and um, the New Bedford Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket Steamboat Company itself, um, while they were a part of the Old Colony Railroad, which owned the Old Colony Steamboat Company uh, within, uh, which owned the Fall River Line and many other popular ferry boat companies. The New Bedford Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket Steamboat Company was not actually a part of that Old Colony Steamboat Company. Um, so they kind of operated separately, even though they were pretty much operating in each other's uh, backyards the whole time. So um, as an FYI, for all of the vessels that I speak about after the year 1886, I'm going to use either the company um, to reference them. And then much later on, this company essentially became the authority um, in the uh, 20th century. So uh, I'm mostly saying the company, so I don't have to keep saying New Bedford, Martha's Vineyard, and Nantucket over and over and over and over. So... Let's go back a little bit. In 1855, the steamer Island Home was built by the Nantucket and Cape Cod Steamboat Company. She was 184 feet, and she traveled the Hyannis to Nantucket route for the line. And by 1860, Martha's Vineyard had become a really popular destination for excursions. Um, and responding to the popularity of the island, the, the line decided to extend their route in 1871, where the Island Home would travel from Hyannis to Nantucket, then to Martha's Vineyard, and then back to Hyannis. So it was around this time um, that rail lines were really beginning to be extended all around the country. Um, and while, while for many people, you might think that steamboat travel, um, while it was very well established, you might think that steamboats and the railroads might be competitors, but they were really more like allies. They were more like teammates yeah. with each other. Yeah. And the um, especially after the Civil War, where many of the railroad lines began buying or leasing out some of the smaller steamboat companies, um, especially those that connected to the railroad. And while, while they might have been seen as competitors, they were actually seen as just an, an extension of the railroad in that way. So <clears throat> on Martha's Vineyard, um, an area of Edgartown uh, broke away and became incorporated as Cottage City. Uh, Cottage City was a Methodist campground and the popularity of camp meetings began to grow and hundreds and eventually thousands of people would be arriving at Cottage City to attend these Methodist meetings. And in 1907, um, we all know the area reincorporated as Oak Bluffs. Uh, that's one of the most popular areas of Martha's Vineyard. In the lower image here, you can see the island home is tied up at the wharf at Cottage City. 
Uh, the Sea View Hotel is on the left hand side of the image. I'm going to show you another similar image in a little bit and talk a little bit more about the Sea View Hotel. Um, one thing that you can see, there's a great example of this in the top image of the island home is that amazing walking beam engine. You can really just see the size and the heft of these walking beams. Another thing to note about the island steamers that you can see in this top hand image is that many of these island steamers had completely open freight decks on their main deck bow. Um, and this was used to maximize the space on the inside for passengers and, of course, smaller baggage. So the, the, the bow was usually used for larger cargo, such as carriages, later on automobiles, and big freight pieces. <clears throat> so in 1872, the railroad line from Boston was completed down to Woods Hole, Falmouth. And the use of Hyannis as a terminus for the steamers to the island of Martha's Vineyard in particular slowed down drastically. Um, the journey from Woods Hole was much shorter uh, than it was from Hyanna. So very similar to the shorter sea route to Nantucket, um, there was a shorter sea route to the vineyard. Um, so Woods Hole really began to be to, to grow in popularity as a terminus for the steamers. So in 1877, this is one of my favorite images, the island home was extensively remodeled by the company um, after their reincorporation. They raised uh, the pilot house of the island home up to the third deck. Um, and in 1896, the island home was sold after 41 years of service for several of the lines. Um, and then she was cut down to a barge, which was interestingly kind of a popular thing to do with these old uh, paddle wheel steamers. In 1890, the company built the vessel, the Gay Head. She was the largest side wheeler to run between the islands. She was 203 feet. She was in regular service between the islands and Woods Hole for several years. And I love this image because you can really get a That's sense great. for how beamy these <laughs> ships were. They have these really wide overhanging guards, or I like to call them the muffin top of the ship. Um, there's a great view of those braces on those guards that help keep that superstructure in place. You can also get a great idea of the churning of the water that these paddle wheels would produce. And it's also a very dramatic image with the ship sort of entering into the foggy abyss. Yeah, very where did you get that? Is that in your collection? It's not in our collection. It's part of the um, Steamboat Historical Society. Huh. Yeah. Great. It's a beautiful image. It's very Lovecraftian with that sort of the fog. Or if you've seen the TV show 1899, it's kind of creepy in that way. So... Um, these are two great images of the interiors of what these vessels would have looked like. Now, they were a lot less elegant than those mammoth um, overnight boats like the Fall River Line that would ply the Long Island Sound. Uh, but the interiors were still quite comfortable. The gay head had uh, was adorned with black walnut and maple woodwork. She had gold trim, um, a beautiful carved staircase. Uh, this is a, these are two images of her saloon deck. Um, now, her saloon deck, compared to those Fall River line steamers, for example, was a fraction of the size and grandeur. But we've got to remember that these boats were used, um, they were not used in the same way as the Fall River line vessels. These were day trip ferries. They were not overnight ferries. Interestingly, though, um, you can see in the, a great um, uh, example of this on the right-hand image, all those doors there. There were still a few private staterooms, but they were really day rooms only. There was a very small bed and then a few chairs. They were really just for people to be able to rest. Um, so this is where I'm gonna stop for a bit. Um, what's really fascinated me about these steamers um, is that this, the, the story of their evolution and the sort of development, not only in the steamers design, uh, both engineering and visually, but the evolution in the vessel's needs for power, um, the, the, the evolution in the needs and expectations that these steamers had to fulfill as well. Um, another thing that really fascinates me is the, the sort of change in terminus from New Bedford to Hyannis, Woods Hole, and then the need to carry more passengers and cargo to the vineyard um, as the economies on the two islands sort of changed a little bit and so on. It's really um, interesting to me because it's very indicative of our region's sort of response to what our residents need. And also, of course, it's a great um, example of our region's pride and love of the water, which you can't deny. Right, and they're still in business. Still in business, still in business today. I would love to see one of these paddle wheel walking beam steamers in, in real life though. I, I, I 
I would be a major proponent of a fundraising campaign to build one of these vessels. No, no boiler explosions. So that's no all. boiler explosions. We've got better technology of these days. So I, I, I bet we don't need that. We don't okay, need it. Elizabeth, so, so what do you think, Bo? Uh, does the vineyard fit into this story or what? Uh, the vineyard absolutely fits into this story, Mike. And as Elizabeth said, reliability is absolutely central to that. When the island home comes on the line, in 1855, she marks a shift in design that makes her functionally the prototype for every side wheel steamer that's built right down to the last one, the Uncatina in 1902. What, reliable, what the reliability of the mid-century steamers did for the vineyard was twofold. On the one hand, it made it incredibly easier for people from the mainland to come to the island to visit those Methodist camp meetings in Oak Bluffs or in what became Oak Bluffs before the Civil War. But also in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War as a bunch of businessmen flush with cash from the whaling industry looked around at the fields adjacent to the campground and said, hmm, that could be a summer resort. They divided it up, sold house lots, and that they could think about doing that and that a summer resort culture could blossom on the vineyard as it did after the Civil War was absolutely tied to the existence of reliable runs on a schedule. You know when you're going to get their steamboats. And to the fact that, as Elizabeth pointed out, they were tightly integrated into the railway networks, the old colony, and then to the west, the New, New York, New Haven, and Hartford that brought people from Connecticut and as far west as New York City. You could, by the end of the 19th century, check your bag in Boston or Penn Station, and it would go on the train, get transferred without your lifting a finger to the steamer, and then wind up on the dock at Oak Bluffs or Vineyard Haven, which when you consider the size and number of the bags people were toting in those days is quite a thing. <laughs> but it also worked the other way around for the vineyard. What the steamers did was, beginning in the 1850s, give residents of the vineyard, those of us, well, the ancestors of those of us who were there year round, the opportunity to be able to reliably think about going to the mainland. And that began a roughly hundred year span in which New Bedford, which had always loomed large in the history of the island. There were an awful lot of vineyarders who went off to New Bedford to try their hand in the whaling industry. But with the advent of the steamers, New Bedford became capital T, capital C, the city. Mm -hmm. If you said to somebody in Edgartown, Oak Bluffs, Vineyard Haven, wherever on the island in the second half of the 19th, first half of the 20th century, oh, we're going to the city next week. It was absolutely understood that you were going to get on the steamer and get off on the waterfront in New Bedford, walk a couple of blocks to the department store and buy your kids Easter clothes or, you know, maybe take in, a, take in a play or have lunch at a nice restaurant or whatever. Going to New Bedford became for generations of vineyarders, the big trip of the year. Boston and New York were impossibly far away, but New Bedford, thanks to the steamers, was usefully close. Mm. And the, as the railroad networks grew, to loop back to bringing people to the vineyard, as the railroad, let me try that again, as the railroad networks grew in the early 20th century, <clears throat> The New, the New York, New Haven, and Hartford ramped up their advertising, played up the we're tightly integrated with the steamboat lines, and produced these marvelous brochures, which are basically just timetables, but they're covered with these, you know, come to the vineyard and vacation like Jay Gatsby imagery of, of these really spiffy 1910s, 1920s people 
in you know cloth caps and goggles and women in fancy dresses and parasols and i'm sure people on the vineyard if they got a look at this were like wow that's pretty cool where's that <laughs> but, <laughs> but the railroad and the steamboat companies were selling a fantasy of get away to this magical summer resort and i've, the, I've seen references bo in these in these papers i have here to the to the camp meeting season or to the camp meeting trade with was that oak bluffs was that the, that was oak bluffs yeah um, the camp meetings the methodists and the baptists ran the formal camp meeting ran for a week every summer and in the days leading up to the camp meeting and during the days that the camp meeting was held, the steamers had put on extra trips and you'd get literally a thousand passengers, 1500 passengers on a single trip. Imagine that picture of the island home with their twin decks and every square foot of those crowded with people. There's one record of one of the steamers and I think the 1880s making a trip with something like 2,500 people on board, which the author noted was a bit on the overloaded side and probably not wise, but they got away with it. So yeah, the camp meeting would have been the big money-making opportunity of the year for the steamboat companies. And just as Elizabeth mentioned, when they weren't running regular service, they'd also in the summer run point to point excursions. For example, beginning in the late 19th century and into the 1920s, the early 1920s, the company would run day excursions from Edgartown, stop at Oak Bluff, stop at Vineyard Haven and go down to Gay Head for the day. Huh. Um, and, you know, you, you hang out in Gay Head, see the sights, climb the lighthouse, so on and so forth, and then get on the steamer again and get deposited back where you started in time for dinner. There was somewhere to land at Gay Head? Not originally. In the 1880s and 90s, they brought the passengers ashore in, in boats, which is <laughs> about as popular as you might expect. <laughs> but by the mid 1890s, they built a wharf at the foot of the cliffs, and there are pictures of people strolling off the uh, ship up the wharf, being met by uh, Wampanoags with ox carts, uh, who, for a modest fee, would bring you up to the top of the cliffs. Well, that's two new things I've learned tonight. I didn't I didn't know about the uh, that that early 1820s ferry that Elizabeth was talking about, and I sure never heard about anybody landing at Gayhead. Um, but what about a way offshore? I mean, what about, you know, Nantucket is, is sticking out their way out there in the Atlantic Ocean all by themselves. Did they benefit from steamers or or, or was this just sort of a, uh, something that was uh, much closer, closer to the mainland, Michael? So it's actually interesting because I've been thinking a lot about that as Elizabeth was talking. Um, you know, Nantucket is famous just like the vineyard for switching its economy over to to being a summer resort, you know, and that's very much a locally driven initiative, you know, okay, whaling is over here, we're not competitive, what else could we do? And they, they you know, there's other acti economic activities, they try fishing, they try silk hat manu or straw hat manufacturing, there's a whole bunch of stuff, you know, but tourism is going to be it. And the steamers are really a big part of that. Um, because before that, you know, all of the sort of coasting trade sloops and schooners that Elizabeth mentioned, that's a huge, huge deal here. There's 150 years of coastal sailing that's bringing everything to the island, is taking all the people on and off, that is connecting the whale oil manufacturing and candle manufacturing here to ports across the country. Huge, huge deal. Um, steamers are not a huge part of that part of the story. But once you get to the summer resort, the steamers are the reliable thing. You get on, there's a schedule, there's extra boats certain times of the year, all the stuff that, that Bo is saying. Um, and then there's a big campaign by locals here in the early 1870s for two boats a day. Let's get two boats a day. And it finally happens in 1874 that there are two boats a day that come to Nantucket and go away from Nantucket, weather permitting, and year round. Um, and that becomes a huge deal. And it really shifts the access that sort of tourist access is New Bedford Vineyard here and back again. And that uh, that's going on. There, there's two boats a day until the 1930s. 
and then it's three modes a day. <laughs> and then still within living memory today are people who remember traveling on the Nobska and on other vessels where they're still coming from New Bedford. And it's that that's the big thing. So it's a huge, huge deal here. Um, but one of the things I'm, wanna... I'm sorry, let me interrupt you for a moment. We have yeah. uh, Nancy Foster here is one of our is, is one of our um, one of our attendees. And she actually says lifelong interest in steamships grew up on Nantucket. Many fond memories of SS Nobska and SS Nantucket Nauschen. So so that's uh, exactly what you're saying. Yeah, totally. So but I'm going to share my screen here and show a few things from our collection here on Nantucket. Um, because there's a bunch of other stuff that Elizabeth said that definitely resonates um, with, with the history of Nantucket here. Um, you know, as I said, the, the coasting schooners and sloops, big deal. So here's an 1852 drawing um, done from the window of the Nantucket Athenaeum looking towards Steamboat Wharf. And we have the telegraph right there near the center and we have the Massachusetts off to the right. And then we have the Tautemo, Tautemio, however you want to pronounce it, uh, one of the packets um, to the mainland right there leaving the dock. So all of this is happening right together. There's also the decrepit um, disused whale ship right there in the center hidden by the warehouse building. Um, the interesting thing here, and this goes back to what Bob said at the very beginning, there's no steam tugboats at Nantucket. Um, there, there never has been. You know, they always come from the mainland when needed. And so the towing and wrecking part of the service that Elizabeth talked about is a really big deal here with the Telegraph and, and the Massachusetts. Um, and so I'll get to that, I'll get back to that idea in just a second. Here we have the Massachusetts. This is from one of our log books from the 1850s, a whaling log book. And Nantucket, late in the whaling story here on Nantucket, the large, larger whaling ships, they can't fit, finish fitting out here at Nantucket, they all go over to the vineyard and they finish fitting out there. So this is the Edward Carey in 1854 on the left, finishing her fitting out. And here's the Massachusetts arriving with the crew ready to go aboard. And so that's all the crew on the foredeck there. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but they're all you know excited to go aboard. Um, little do they know what they're getting into. Um, you know, and the Massachusetts is the vessel that does this for them. Um, and then in that towing thing, you know, here is the Massachusetts towing a whaling ship um, in the camels. Everybody probably knows the story of the camels, the floating dry dock that was built in the early 1840s to float Nantucket vessels in and out of the harbor over the sandbar. And it's these coastal steamers, it's the Telegraph and the Massachusetts are the towing boats for this. Um, they're also the towing boats and wrecking boats whenever anything happens um, because there's no local, no, no otherwise local uh, steamer service that's here to do that. Um, here is a fragment of the towing hauser from, from one of these vessels. Um, this is a 1906 donation to our collection. Somebody saved this and, and kept it. it. You can't get a sense of the scale, unfortunately, in this photograph, but on your screen, it's a bit bigger than what actually shows on your screen. Um, so love that. Massive. Uh, and then we get to the island home. I wanted to get into, we have a lot of stuff from the island home. Um, this is a Wendell Macy uh, painting. He, he, you know, he worked a lot here and on the mainland. He painted a lot of scenes that he thought people would want to collect and take home. Um, and so he did multiples. So there are multiple Wendell Macy paintings of the island home um, and this, this being one of them. Um, so pretty great. I'm going to draw your attention to the paddle box and the very center of the paddle box, the gold painted here, the lunette uh, with the eagle in it. Mm -hmm. uh, here is that eagle. Ooh. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> so when the vessel retired, uh, the Nantucket Historical Association bought both of the paddle lunettes. Here's the other one. Um, we bought these. We got some other fragments. We have a cane made out of one of the staircase banisters. We've got the glass cover for the binnacle from the wheelhouse. A um, whole bunch of stuff for that. Uh, these are great. Um, they've suffered a little bit from being repainted with with wacky paint over time, um, but uh, pretty great examples surviving from the island home. Um, we also have, you know, this is a little um, pinback badge stamped, you know, the clerk for the island home and some of the evidence of the clerk's activities. Here we have a receipt for freighting. Elizabeth uh, was mentioning the sort of cost of, of one of these voyages. Um, you know, a couple dollars to get across. I, I say that casually, that's not a casual amount of money, as she said, 
Um, here we have the freight for bringing a carriage, one carriage for Henry Coffin, the whale oil merchant and ship owner in 1856. Um, this is actually, it's more expensive to bring this carriage over. We just acquired uh, another receipt from 1860 um, for the movement of two oxen uh, on the island home. That was 50 cents, um, plus an additional amount for the railroad. So, you know, again, the two, the two working together, which is pretty great. Um, I wanted to show this. This is Nathan Manter. He's one of the captains, a uh, very famous captain of the island home. Um, he um, struck up a friendship with the painter Eastman Johnson. Uh, Eastman Johnson summered on Nantucket for about nine years and he would meet locals and he'd use them as models. And uh, he really liked these sea captain characters. Um, and Nathan Manter is not as old and decrepit as depicted here. <laughs> this is Eastman Johnson wanting to create the image of the, the grizzled sea captain. Um, but Manter was active as captain of the island home at the time this painting was done. Um, and there are other pictures of him, you know, engravings and stuff where he looks a lot younger <laughs> than, than he does here. Um, but this is a pretty great, pretty great picture that's in our collection um, that relates to, to this. Um, I also throw in, um, many of you will be familiar with um, Absalom Boston, um, African-American sea captain um, and, and actually real estate owner here on Nantucket, um, who took out and commanded an all-Black whaling, whaling voyage uh, in 1822. Um, his second wife was a stewardess on the island home, um, and she did that work after he died uh, in order to support herself and her family. Uh, and in fact, she died not long after coming ashore from a voyage. Um, she fell ill during a voyage and then was brought ashore and passed away. Um, I unfortunately don't have an image of her, uh, which mm. I use the image of, of her husband, um, but it's a reminder that you know, not just are these vessels a sort of lifeline, another way of connection, reliability, but the people working on them are people from all the communities that we're talking about. You know, Nathan Manter lives here on Nantucket and is commanding this vessel. Undoubtedly, his crew are from all over the place. Um, there are women in the crew, as evidenced by, by Mary Boston, um, and they're not all just white people. You know, so there are there are more stories there. I think there's a lot more, you know, digging up you know who all these people are and what they're doing you know i actually we don't have in our collection any interior views of the island home i'd love to know what the ladies salon on the island home looked like um you know to know the sort of working space in which mary boston was working um but i think that that sort of you know there, that, there's that additional local hyper local connection to this of, of who's working and what are they doing and that completely obtains to the day yeah well what about what about Na nancy's uh Great grandfather Manuel Rosa, you know, who was born in the Azores and and uh, and you know, uh, is raised in New Bedford and works for the Steamship Authority for fifty years. Yep. Um, you know, and um, you know his uh, you know his family. What did she say? He was born in eighteen seventy, worked for the steamship at eighteen, retired in nineteen forty two. Um, he and his family would live in Nantucket during the summer as the boat would overnight there. That's how my mother met my Nantucket dad. So, you know, just like you say, Michael, you know, these are, this is, this is local stuff. Yep. Yep, exactly. And I'll throw in my grandparents. Um, they, they courted um, on a, a steamer in the Detroit river. Uh, my grandfather worked as an engineer and, and she would come aboard, take the trip, and then he would have time off. So it happens in other places too. <laughs> That, they're, that these are making all the connections. I just wanted to conclude really quickly with a couple, a few great photos from our collection. Um, here's the island home tied up at Steamboat Wharf on Nantucket um, with some, some cat boats and some, some rowing boats, a mixture of sort of summer and winter vessels um, all done here. Uh, love this. This is Captain Barzilai Burdett, local boat builder and, um, and excursion runner in his cat boat, um, nice. his young charge. Um, and there's the island home in the background. Constant, you know, the, all the steamer. It's, it's true today that the, the the arrival of the ferries is a backdrop for your summer experience. And you're out at a garden party on Brant Point, and the steamer comes by, and everybody stops and watches it. That same thing here in 1880 when this picture was taken. And then just one final one. Um, of course, winter time. Uh, this was um, this was long cataloged as island homes stuck in the ice. Um, 
This is not the island home stuck in the ice. This is the island home arriving, pushing her way through the ice. Um, although there definitely were times when she couldn't quite get to the pier and you see them with, with the boat there, um, they would often you know, bring out boat, slide boats across the ice to get cargo on and off. Um, but you know, year round service, weather permitting. So pretty great stuff. That's what I got. Well, that's pretty great. So, I mean, there, there we have it. You know, we have, uh, we have uh, Martha's Vineyard and Hyannis, and we have, you know, camp meetings on the vineyard, and we have, uh, you know, railheads at, uh, at Fairhaven and New Bedford and, uh, and excursion steamers out to Nantucket, um, all sort of tied up. And we didn't even talk about the New Bedford end, so I didn't I didn't say anything at all about the about really about the New Bedford end, uh, but that's that's all right. Um, you know, we're going to be doing these these talks for uh, for a long time, so uh, we may you know very well come back and and visit this uh, this subject again, um, just because you know people like Nancy are out there, who, you know, who are who's who's you know families helped run the steamers, um, so uh, you know this is uh, thank you all very much for great insights, uh, you know, tying all these maritime communities together. Um, thanks. Um, thank you, Bob, for, uh, for, for cool. introducing us to Elizabeth's work. Um, I'm going to, you know, pay closer attention to, uh, to what my colleagues or colleagues are doing publicly. Um, and, uh, and we also, we should also thank, we have to remember to thank our, 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 our technical services um, person, uh, Carissa Walker here at the, at the museum. You know, she's, um, she's do, she you. does a great job. So um, thank you all for that. Um, and I think this pretty much concludes our January local history guild. We've got, we got steamships and, and uh, island homes and, and camp meetings. And what else did we get? Tugboats and and ferry boats with tillers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tugboats and ferry boats with tillers and and immigrants and uh, um, and business people. So yeah, it was good. Um, but as you all know, this is the awkward part of the evening. You know, it's it's like it, it's awkward. This you know these Zoom these these Zoom meetings are are so awful because you just have to say goodbye and then you hit the leave button and everything sort of ends and it's just sort of awkward. Um, I. I don't have uh, a title for y'all for um, for February, but I think it has to do with the polar bear uh, exhibition here at the museum. And um, my colleague, my boss Naomi Slip, is going to line up uh, line up a speaker for for, for um, to uh, to to have a conversation about polar bears. Um, you know, coming up in um, coming up in February. So again. Friends, thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you for agreeing to share your expertise, Bo and, and Michael and Elizabeth and Bob. And um, I hope to... The young charge in the stern of the catboat is my grandfather, Benjamin Carl Sharp. Did you see that, Michael? Yes. Did you know that's who he was? I did. Yeah? I did. I should have said it. There's a, I could go on for a whole half an hour about the Sharp family. <laughs> Well, we'll do that. We'll, we'll, we'll do that next time. We'll, we'll schedule another one, and, and uh, we can explore your collection uh, via Zoom. So, um, so thank y'all. Thanks, thank Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Hope you had a good time. Night, everybody. Good night, then. <laughs>